Support Wrestle Talk. Support each other. He's not the chairman, he's a very naughty boy. As my sexy dad once wrote, controversy creates cash, and world wrestling entertainment is certainly no stranger to the shouty stuff. After all, you could argue it's the number one job of half their roster to generate outrage, but even for companies whose mission statement isn't repeatedly pushing the psychological buttons of its fan base, no one sticks around for as long as Vince McMupsey's Hall of Whoopsies without committing a major snafu or two. There's storyline heat, and then there's the other kind, the kind that makes Vince McMahon do one of his scary, intense interviews on TV where he tries to knock papers out of reporters' hands. Vince, why are you so weird? Strap in, here are 12 moments that got WWE in serious trouble. Number 12, Daniel Bryan makes a first impression. 2010 was a pretty bad year for WWE. Miz won the WWE Championship. Randy Orton RKO'd Meatloaf and I'll never forgive him for it. There was an awful lot of Sheamus everywhere. Bret Hart was raw general manager and looked like he was only doing so because he was being held at gunpoint. Rough stuff, but there was one all-time classic segment, Raw, June 7th, the arrival of the Nexus. Everything about it worked, from Cena getting swarmed by these terrifying children like a poorly received clown at a birthday party, the ring getting completely gutted, to the commentary team being taken out, letting everything play out in wonderful, eerie quiet. Part of the bloodbath was Justin Roberts getting attacked for the very first time. No one had laid a hand on him prior to this night, but they ripped off his shirt and Daniel Bryan choked him with his tie before spitting in the face of John Cena. Daniel Bryan is cool, but his actions drew WWE major heat from their sponsors. WWE just signed a big deal with toy maker Mattel the year before and was still only really in the beginning of their awkward PG TV phase. Despite not telling the WWE newcomers what was and what wasn't allowed in the PG guidelines before they went out there, Brian was found to have broken those unwritten rules and corporate sources still not explicitly named to this day forced Vince to terminate Brian's contract. Welcome to the big leagues, Daniel. It's merciless and confusing here. Number 11, chat shit get banged. Today, John John Stossel looks like the painting that Tom Selleck kept in his attic for years to preserve his eternal youth, but back in 1984, he was a reporter on long-running investigation show 20-20. Sorry, I don't like saying the actual name of the TV show because it reminds me of this terrible fucking year that just won't fucking stop. Anyway, as part of a 20-20 episode looking at the secrets of professional wrestling, Stossel attended a WWF show in Madison Square Garden where he ran into a terrifying man called David Schultz, i.e. what you would get if you combined Sid Vicious and Stone Cold Steve Austin and forgot to teach that monster how to love. Dossel interviewed Schultz and told him he thought wrestling was fake. I mean, bold play of John to corner a man hopped up on adrenaline and maybe other things to say, hey, your job is dumb and all that stuff about being tough is a lie. Patience is a virtue unbeknownst to David Schultz, who proceeded to knock Stossel to the ground twice with open hand slaps. Schultz was suspended and eventually fired by WWF. The company was sued for half a million. There was an outcry in the press and to make things worse, Schultz claims that on that fateful day, he was encouraged by Vince himself to, quote, Blast him, tear his ass up, stay in character. Number 10, WrestleMania makes a first impression. There are three golden rules to putting on a successful event. Book the venue, nail your advertising, and make sure your biggest attraction doesn't choke out a major TV talk show host and break his head open on live television for f days before the show. On all matters, especially public relations, Hogan knows best. Four days before WrestleMania 1, you know, the event that Vince McMahon gambled the life of his company on no pressure, Hogan and Mr. T appeared on Hot Properties with comedian Richard Belzer. Throughout the interview, Belzer scratches the same dangerous itch as Stossel, asking Hogan how he turned heel to face while kayfabe was still alive and asking to be put in a wrestling hold. The Hulkster finally obliged and put Belzer in a front chin lock. Now, speaking as a former comedian myself, we're delightfully fragile, made of glass and unresolved insecurities about our sexy dads. Bells are passed out in the hold, and while that actually might have worked in WWF's favor, showcasing the real dangers of wrestling, Hogan didn't realize that Bells was unconscious and dropped him, with him landing hard and cracking his head open on the studio floor. Bells are sued for millions of dollars and eventually bought a house in France with the settlement money, which he then went on to call Shay Hogan. Number nine, Vader bombs. Assaulting someone on TV in your native country is one thing, because when things go south, you can just dip, but it's another matter entirely if you start a rumpus while abroad. At that point, you go from being angry man to angry American man, and that's a lot scarier. In April 1997, WWF were in Kuwait as part of a house show tour of the Middle East. Undertaker was champ at the time and appearing on Good Morning Kuwait with one of the best big men to ever do it, Vader. The two wrestlers were told that a question was gonna come up on whether wrestling was 
fake and oh boy it worked twice before so sure give it a go lad it was agreed that dr grim medicine woman would field the question and he did but then oh no vader asked to retort as well it's like undertaker diffused the bomb with nail clippers only for vader to open fire on the bomb he flipped the table grabbed the host by the tie and shouted does that feel fake? Almost a bigger crime than assault because you do not swear on TV in Kuwait. Vader was arrested and because the incident coincided with a religious holiday, had to spend two weeks trapped overseas, which is a hell of a naughty step. Number eight, I now denounce you Chuck and Billy. So, Billy and Chuck and WWE's delightful relationship with homosexuality. WWE have long been behind the times when it comes to sexual politics, from commentators making inside jokes whenever out but not publicly out, Pat Patterson was on screen, Jerry Lawler calling Goldust a I'm not going to repeat it, to a depressingly large pop, and of course the tag team of Billy and Chuck, who were apparently just guys being pals. It's hard to nail down what their gimmick was. No wait it isn't, they acted gay and the crowd laughed about it. TNA went a similar route with one of their teams called the Rainbow Express, and while that was hateful bollocks too, at least TNA had the nerve to present actually kayfabe gay characters. When it came time for Billy and Chuck to become life partners in what was obviously a wedding, WWE actually tried to gain PR points by working with the Gay and Lesbian Alliance against defamation to apparently craft this angle. However, this massively blew up in WWE's face when during the ceremony, Chuck and Billy said, whoa, 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 we're not gay. And no amount of, but there's nothing wrong with that could stop Glad from publicly condemning WWE for using civil partnership as a ratings and PR hook, bottling it at the last minute and beating up the not gay characters during their not gay wedding. Number seven, Hulk Hogan is really good on talk shows. In 1991, the WWF got into scoldingly hot water that would embrace their company for several years, the infamous steroid scandal. In 1988, anabolic steroids were classed as an illegal substance. In 1991, Dr. George Sahorian was arrested for selling those steroids to professional wrestlers. One of the wrestlers that Long Island Dr. Z claimed he sold to was the Hulkster. To try and get some of the heat off Hogan and the company, he went on the Arsenio Hall show. And somehow, this went even worse than hot properties. Hogan spent the entire time claiming that he'd never used steroids, that he'd always been just a big kid, and that he'd never seen anyone take them. No one believed the Hulkster, who looked uncomfortable on camera throughout, and the story continued to build momentum. Ironically, most commentators at the time thought if Hogan had just admitted to using them and pledging to clean up both himself and the WWF, he wouldn't have received half the backlash. But now he was the figurehead of the steroid story, and his reputation was burned, so Hogan took a year of absence from the WWF before eventually departing the company altogether in 1993. In the steroid trial of 94, Hogan would admit to being on the juice, and the WWF would then mock Hogan for his steroid use in the infamous Billionaire Ted sketches, which is definitely a pot cutting a promo on the kettle. Number six, Snickers versus the fabulous Moolah. Turns out Snickers aren't themselves when they're angry and they sure did get their nougat in a twist after WrestleMania 33. After a few years of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, WWE wanted to throw a female equivalent to essentially give their entire women's division a WrestleMania payday, which they christened the fabulous Moolah Battle Royal. Only problem was, while she may have been the most defining female star of her era, Fabulous Moolah also came with some real skeletons in her closet, and stories began to circulate online alleging Moolah to have signed female trainees to exploitative contracts, essentially indebting them to her throughout their careers, and other allegations that she would supply female prospects to promoters for sexual purposes. Some have come to Moolah's defense on that latter charge, but regardless, the media storm was so intense that Snickers demand WWE remove Moolah's name from the Battle Royal. WWE may not listen to their fans, but they will listen to Big Candy, and it's been the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal ever since. Since. Number five, Trish barks like a dog. There are wrestling angles that just hang around WWE forever like bad smells. There are some that wrestling fans themselves will constantly mention like Katie Vick, Mae Young's hand, or anything Hornswoggle ever touched. Actually, we LC was good, but I digress. Then there are the angles that people outside the industry constantly use whenever they want to bash the company. And in that sense, Trish being forced to bark like a dog on Raw has haunted WWE. Trish was Vince's mistress at the time before WrestleMania X7 was trying to win him back. He told her to crawl around on her hands and knees like a dog as he did the Vince walk around the ring. He told her to bark and this caused a huge amount of controversy. It was one of the central criticisms hurled at Vince during an excruciatingly tense on the record interview with Bob Costas where Vince defended himself saying I was being a bad guy and that he was going to get his comeuppance. Now I mean yes people did boo Vince during this segment when he fought 
forced Trish to bark, but then he also forced Trish to take her clothes off, at which point everyone cheered him, so good argument there. In terms of segments from the Attitude Era that are used to remind everyone of how bad that era can be, when Linda was running for the Senate 11 years later, that segment was used to help cripple her campaign. That's how much people hated it. Number four, Muhammad Hassan and 7-7. Muhammad Hassan was Italian in real life. That's the point we're starting from. So you've got an Italian-American playing an Arab-American complaining about the treatment of Muslims in the US after 9-11, less than five years after the attacks. That is a spicy combination of pushed buttons. Look, some people could argue, probably WWE employees with a faraway sad look in their eyes, that Hassan was a multi-layered gimmick designed to expose the hypocrisies of weaponized patriotism. Or it could have been an Arabic character getting booed for doing Arabic things by a country that had not processed its collective grief. Point is, Hassan was young, he was talented, and he was going to ride this questionable gimmick to the top. That is, until a fateful day that ended his career in an instant. On a pre-taped episode of SmackDown in 2005, Hassan began to pray and seemed to summon a group of mercenaries that, yeah, looked like the standard cliché terrorist to attack The Undertaker. This episode of SmackDown then went on to air the exact same day as the 7-7 bombings in London, and it aired unedited. There was a major backlash, and SmackDown's network at the time, UPN, pressured WWE to keep Hassan off television. He was written off in an injury at the next pay-per-view, and he never came back. By the way, did you know that the guy who played Muhammad Hassan co-wrote a comic book with the late Shad Gaspard? It's called Assassin and Son, and you can actually still buy copies of it online. Might be a nice thing to do. Number three, going ahead with Crown Jewel. WWE have a long-term agreement to produce supercards in Saudi Arabia as part of a cultural scheme called Saudi Vision 2030. When WWE first signed the deal, it was controversial owing to Saudi Arabia's, shall we say, a strange relationship with a variety of civil rights. However, the situation will worsen in 2018 when, in October, noted Saudi dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi was murdered by the order of the government in a Saudi embassy in Turkey mere weeks before the latest supercard, Crown Jewel, was scheduled to take place in Riyadh. Literally, the tickets went on sale the same day that the Saudi government confirmed that Khashoggi had been killed in the embassy. Everyone pilloried WWE for still going ahead with the show. John Oliver put out a piece about it, and even Republican senators came out and said, yeah, Vince, you got this one wrong, buddy. The show went ahead, of course, leading John Cena, Daniel Bryan, Kevin Owens to refuse to work the show and the cloud hanging over the Saudi relationship just grows darker and darker as the shows get worse and worse. Like an aging rock star who can't play the hits anymore so he tries to win the crowd back by juggling knives. And I hope you enjoyed that joke because it's the last one of the list. Everything's real sad from here on out. Number two, Owen Hart's death. Yeah. As illustrated by the episode of Dark Side of the Ring that covered it, the death of Owen Hart was a totally avoidable tragedy. At Over the Edge 1999, he was to be lowered from the ceiling via a harness, which released too early, and he fell to the ring below, dying shortly thereafter. The pay-per-view continued, which by itself would have been f***ing gross enough to earn WWF wide condemnation, but then the questions of WWE's responsibility came into play. The harness he used was small, and the clip was not the industry standard for holding a grown adult's weight. Instead, it was a quick-release clip designed to save a few seconds of awkward unhooking airtime. Vince was attacked about the security measures in a press conference after the show, which he handles typically brilliantly. The company was railed against by the media, including Bob Costas in that horrible on-the-record interview, and Owen's widow Martha remains so convinced of WWE's culpability in her husband's death that she refuses to allow Owen Hart to be inducted into their Hall of Fame. She believes that such a move of public good faith between her and the company would dissolve WWE's guilt over the tragic accident. And number one, the Chris Benoit tribute episode. Now, I'm going to try and keep this brief, it's just sad. Over a weekend in 2007, Chris Benoit murdered his wife and son and then killed himself on the Sunday. On Monday, WWE knew that the family was dead but were unaware of the circumstances. Despite that, they aired a Chris Benoit tribute show with his greatest matches, moments, and talking heads from wrestlers. When the company found out the true nature of the deaths, they immediately removed all mentions of Chris Benoit from their history, released a statement distancing themselves from the tribute they had just paid him, but still, the media went into a frenzy, initially blaming steroids, before an examination of Benoit's brain showed the damage of decades of concussions. The deaths and the subsequent media storm changed WWE on a fundamental level, from drug testing, concussion awareness, down to the banning of a wide variety of moves. The lasting effects of the Benoit murders continue, but the tribute episode will never again see the light of day. As JR said on Dark Side of the Ring, we tried to honour the guy, honour his family, his fans, but we didn't have the full story. Shame on us for that, I guess. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Wrestle talk for a more light-hearted video check out our 11 worst championship title belts list that's got loads more jokes in it i promise take care everyone